Hi, and welcome once again to Eye of the Needle, a podcast from Columbia Threadneedle Investments that aims to demystify the world of investing and put a spotlight on the people looking after your money. I'm Jim Griffin, Investment Content Manager, and joining me as co-host is Corinne Walker, Investment Campaigns Manager. Hi, Corinne. How are you? Hello, Jim. I'm good, thank you. Glad to hear it. Uh, and who is joining us on the pod this time around, Karim? Uh, we have two guests with us this time, Jim. We've got Dave Dodging and Scott Woods, who are both Global Equity Portfolio Managers. We'll be talking to them about Global Equities Universe, Competitive Advantage, Disruption and much, much more. Dave, Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, this episode will also feature our ongoing ABC of Investing series, This Month in History, and Three Things to Ask Your IFA This Month. But before we get to that, we're going to head straight into the 60 second challenge in which Scott and David have one minute to explain to listeners all about their asset class. So you both work on the Global Equities desk, but what exactly is that? What makes it different from other desks and how does it supplement regional desks? Um, hopefully you can enlighten us on all that within just 60 seconds. Are you ready for the challenge? Just about. I think we're up for it. Yeah, I think we can do it. Good stuff. Okay, good luck chaps and your time starts now. Uh, the Global Equities Desk, as the name implies, really invests in companies around the world. So you're actually a part owner of these businesses rather than investing in their in their debt. Um, as you might expect from, from a, a global fund, it's sort of dominated by the US, um, but Europe and, and Japan are also um, significant um, parts of what we can look at. And emerging um, markets as well. And emerging markets is obviously of increasing importance as well. Um, and there are thousands of companies with which, you know, from from what the, that we can choose between, um, no. both amongst small cap and, 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 and large cap. And we can piggyback off of the work that are done by the regional desks here. So we're lucky that we've got European, US emerging markets teams and also our colleagues in the United States as well. How do we do? Look at we that. Do, we do. <laughs> do we get a prize for going under 60 seconds? It didn't, it didn't hear the clacks and go off. Oh, that, was, uh, that was a good effort. Very, very good. Great. Before we delve into your asset class and working lives in more depth, we're going to continue our exploration of the world of finance with our ABC of investing. That's right, listeners. Our attempt to demystify the jargon-heavy world of investment goes on. And this episode, we tackle P, Q and R. P is for price to earnings ratio, also known as PE. This is a measure for valuing a company calculated by dividing its share price by its earnings per share. A low PE can indicate that a company is undervalued, though this does not always mean it is a good investment, while a high PE can indicate it's overpriced. Q is for quantitative easing. QE involves the creation of money by central banks like the Bank of England or the European Central Bank, which is used to buy things like government debt or bonds. By injecting this money directly into the economy, the aim is to boost spending and investment. R is for recession. A recession is a period of significant decline in economic activity, during which trade and industrial outputs are reduced. It is generally identified by a fall in GDP for two successive quarters. Right, Corinne, let's get back to David and Scott. I think it's time to find out in more detail how they approach the world of investing. So, Scott, by definition, global equities covers a lot of bases. Can you tell us about the global equities range we offer and your particular area of focus? Yeah, sure. So, we offer lots of different uh, products depending on what your investment needs are. So we have income products, we have uh, long short products, um, and then we have uh, small cap and large cap products. So I work on the small cap products where I invest in companies with uh, smaller market capitalizations on a global basis. So a broad range of different, uh, different products for different needs. Um, and how would you define small cap? Uh, for small cap for me, it's anything that's below $10 billion market capitalization. Um, and it's a great place to be able to invest. Uh, you're looking at uh, thousands of different businesses um, and they're all, you know, the, we're looking at companies that are going to be the large caps of tomorrow and the leaders um, of 
uh, in the future. So for me, I love it because I've got this broad range of different companies to look at and they tend to be small niche businesses that focus on just one different thing. So, you know, I look at WD-40 and WD-40 only sells cans of WD-40. It's a focused business model. Um, so for me, it's really exciting. I can find these very niche specialized businesses. And every house has a can for that. And so it's interesting, WD-40 is in more US households than Coca-Cola. Um, so it's in nine out of 10 US households. Um, uh, it's, yeah, um, I've been to, funny enough, I've been to their, uh, I've been to their headquarters in San Diego and it is, yeah. the original formula is locked in a bank vault somewhere in San Diego, uh, the original recipe. Well, they can't, they can't get it out. No, no, it's been stuck there. So you just, no, it's, no, it's where they keep WD-41, it's just like stuck with it. Um, and so, yeah, um, you know, you find those types of businesses and literally all WD-40 tries to do when it wakes up in the morning is sell more cans of WD-40. Um, so it's a very focused business model. Yeah, that's what you want. Um, so over to you, David, could you tell us a bit about your investment philosophy? What do you look for in businesses? Yeah, so I, I run quite a concentrated um, portfolio of about 40 names and obviously there are millions of, or thousands of companies around the world that we, that we could invest in. Uh, this strategy tends to have a sort of a bias towards quality growth companies. Um, so quality we would define as companies, basically they're very profitable, so they have um, high returns on capital employed, it often means high margins. Um, they tend not to be very volatile um, and they tend not to have too much debt. Um, so really it's a style of investing that's all based around the concept of a, of a moat. Um, so in medieval Europe, castles had moats around them which were supposed to protect them from uh, sort of in, invading crusaders and knights. <laughs> um, and basically we look for businesses that um, that, that have these barriers against competitors. And that means they can remain profitable for a very long time. So we have this bias towards great businesses that we think can remain great, but we also try and identify companies where the, the moat is maybe quite small at the moment, but it's getting bigger. So these are companies that don't appear to be great, but we think they're on their way to, to achieving that. What kind of things do you look at when, when you're trying to figure out this moat? At an industry level, we use the, the Porter's Five yeah. Forces model, um, which yeah. certainly... What, can you just explain a little bit about that? Yeah, Porter's Five Forces basically puts a, 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 a business in, in its sort of context. So it says, what's the relative strength of this business um, compared to its suppliers, its customers? How competitive is the industry? Um, what are the barriers to entry or the threats of, 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 of a new entrant? So you're really, you ideally want a business which has thousands of suppliers, millions of customers, so that they're very powerful relative to those players. Probably that's in a concentrated industry where there are a few players, because that tends to mean the pricing power is a bit better and you want high barriers to entry, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. And then, we also look at um, competitive advantage, um, which is sort of similar and a company with competitive advantage typically will have the ability to raise prices. Um, so there we, we, we go along with a, a sort of morning star definition of the sources of competitive advantage, which would be um, so intangible got... assets, which would be things like brand names or patents, uh, scale, there are some industries where you know, once you've dug a, once you've made a railway, no one ever really bothers to to, 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 to build it again along the same, you know, on, on exactly the same areas. Uh, a cost base that that could be a competitive advantage. Switching costs, you know, sometimes no one ever got fired for buying IBM. Uh, I, 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 I guess it's the, when a when a component might be sort of not not terribly important in the overall scheme of things, but but can actually be you know why why try and save a small amount of money by by swapping something that's sort of integral to the product yeah. um, out for something cheaper um, network and, effects. and the network effect which yeah. is uh, a lot of people would argue the, the most significant um, competitive advantage that a company can have which is where uh, something like a visa or a mastercard where the more banks and retailers and consumers who accept 
the, the, the cards, as it were, yeah. the better it is for everyone. Um, and so though those businesses can, it, it can be quite hard to disrupt that, that, that network. Yeah, and so you know, I, for me, I'm trying to find businesses that fit, you know, similar similar themes to uh, to Dave, but in the small cap universe. So, again, I look, I look for businesses that have those sort of economic moats, but I'm looking for them down down the market cap scale. So, I already mentioned WD40, that's got amazing brand power, like uh, network effect. I own a business that's the largest auctioneer of industrial equipment called Ritchie Brothers, and you know, I've been to one of their auctions in Rotterdam, and it's literally like a huge. Uh, field full of cranes and tractors and uh, and they do a big live auction like Sotheby's and Christie's would but again that's a business where the more buyers attracts more sellers and it becomes a virtuous circle. Um, what did you buy? Uh, I, I bought myself a front end loader for uh, for home. Um, my girlfriend was really disappointed by uh, my lack of capital rationale but, just, um, but I thought it was great they didn't you know it's annoying they didn't they said afterwards I could have driven one of the tractors and I was like how could I that's I really wanted to do that they so, yeah, didn't say that at the time I was like yes I absolutely want to drive a digger around for the day that sounds fantastic you know, both Dave and I have the same investment philosophy we're just doing it looking at different size companies it seems like you really know these companies you're really getting down and dirty with them it's such a huge universe to choose from. How do you keep on top of all the risks and the opportunities globally? Um, so lucky that we've got um, these regional small cap teams around me who really dominate yeah, their market in terms of knowledge. You know, they they feed ideas up to me, um, and they uh, and they're a great source of ideas. So rather than having to go and do it all on my own and trying to, you know, I only want to own around eighty businesses. If I had to do that on my own, um, with the thousands of companies that are out there, it would probably take me quite a long time. But I think that's another uh, important thing is to try and focus on a relatively limited number of companies because, which hopefully you can know a lot more about, as it were, rather than trying to have a little bit of everything. And that's why Scott has a relatively concentrated portfolio, just 80 um, in, in small caps, and why um, in, in, in in the fund that I run, there'd only be about 40. And that does help you sort of try and focus down on, on, you, on your best ideas. And I think also given our style, it, it does rule out large parts of the market. So um, both Scott and myself would be quite underweight um, commodity, commodity type areas. Yeah, yeah so um, oil and gas, U mining. Utilities, you know, where basically these companies can't don't really have a sustainable competitive advantage like you look at utilities their returns are regulated by governments it can be it can be difficult for that business over the long term to generate a return over its cost of capital so by cutting out a, a, a large part of the, the the market i guess it means that you're yeah lowering your your your, your workload and you know you're, you're playing to your strengths yeah it's just we want to you know we focus on the fundamentals of businesses right like we want to understand you can already tell that dave and i want to understand what a business does when we're not uh we want to understand why it has that sustainable competitive advantage and to do that you've got to look at the fundamentals of that business to understand why in five or ten years it might still have that that competitive edge so by only you know looking at a concentrated portfolio we can find you know we want to understand really in depth what these companies do we go visit the companies we go so we meet management all the time um, so that we can understand why that business has that competitive edge so by having a concentrated portfolio means we can stay on top of these businesses and and be able to judge whether that business will still have that competitive edge and i guess we both try and be reasonably long term yeah. so we're not that interested in whether a company beats consensus forecast for earnings in this quarter or next. I mean, it's great. You have to. <laughs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, we're, we're not, we're, we're not, we're trying to avoid the companies that, that, that do miss, but, but we are really interested in sort of a three to five year uh, time horizon. And so, yeah, we, we try and not focus too much on, on the short term, but try and work out what strategic advantages these companies have. Because you think, if you think of the type, you know, if we go back to Dave saying about these businesses that, you know, why do you want to invest in these businesses that generate these high returns on invested capital above their cost of capital? So the reason, you know, the businesses we look for already tend to have, you know, a competitive advantage to begin with, they're good companies, but it's the ability of these companies to continue generating these returns for five, 10 years, rather than just the next one or two. So, you know, the, the simplest way to think about that is the market assumes that, 
if their company, this company has some sort of competitive edge. So let's say Dave owns uh, a bakery in a town and he's charging 40 pounds for a loaf of bread. I'm probably going to come in and set up another bakery across the road because Dave's generating way, way too high returns. On this. You, you might have- Are you suggesting that I've eaten all the pie? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, but you know, so I'm going to come in and erode that, those returns away, right? And it's the same for businesses uh, in the market. The market assumes that these competition is going to come in and erode these competitive advantages away. But if you can find businesses with these economic moats around them, they continue to generate these returns for longer than the market assumes. WD-40 has been around since the 50s. It's got a really wide economic moat and it continues to compound out those returns. But you have to have that long-term view to be able to realise some of those, uh, to realise some of those opportunities. Yeah. Now, David, um, your overweight financials in your global portfolios, uh, and particular Indian banks, um, can you tell us, A, what that means, and B, why is this a market that interests you so much? Um, well, being overweight is a, is a sort of term that refers to how big a stock is within an index. So, in my case, I, I, I tend not to use it really because I'm only investing in such a small number of stocks that I'm investing in businesses because I really like them. So it, it doesn't really bother me what the weight in the index is. Um, now, most quality focus funds, um, which, which this tends to be, would basically ignore financials or certainly banks and life insurance companies almost entirely. So this is quite a different situation. Um, uh, it's quite unusual, and it, but it's one of the things where I spoke earlier, I think about not just investing in the highest quality companies, but also investing in companies where the, the, the moat is getting bigger. And in the case of India, um, in some of the private sector banks, um, they have become sort of, or they are becoming more and more compelling as investments. And that's for a variety of reasons. So firstly, you have the Indian economy, um, has grown very significantly over the last 10 years, uh, has very supportive demographics um, and people, there's still relatively low levels of, 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 of borrowing, etc. Uh, and, and low levels of debt. So there's plenty, there's a long runway for, for, for growth for the financial system. Um, and then within the financial system, the government has obviously been encouraging um, people to set up bank accounts. Um, and is transferring welfare payments directly to bank accounts now, and that's backed by a sort of national identification scheme. Uh, a few years ago, obviously, a lot of banknotes were withdrawn from circulation to encourage people to sort of uh, open a bank account and to, to transfer money electronically, which is all part of a sort of a, a, a war on the black economy, you know, cash-based, which has obviously been very big in India for, for a long time. Um, but the private sector banks have also, on top of that, um, incentivization and the, the growth of the banking system. Um, they've also been taking large amounts of share from the government-owned banks. Um, the government-owned banks got into trouble a few years ago and, and basically don't have too much money to lend. Um, so some of the private sector banks have been able to step in. Now they've been, you know, 18 months or so ago, the companies that we were invested in were signing up um, sort of hundreds of thousands of new customers a month. Um, so it was really impressive, but also with electronification, I guess you don't need to open as many branches. And if you do that, your cost income ratio comes down. So basically you become more cost effective and that means you can offer better products more cheaply and you get a virtuous circle where you keep winning market share. So um, unlike most quality fund managers, we think that um, the banks that we're invested in have a very significant competitive advantage and that's why they'll keep gaining share against a backdrop of a, an economy that's got um, attractive growth, long-term growth prospects. So um, it, it's a very sort of unique situation, I guess, and we think that in emerging markets, you, you, you can differentiate yourself as a, as, a, as a bank in a way that you probably can't in, in developed markets. So Scott, um, technology has been a key market driver in recent years. What are your thoughts on tech um, as a sector and its influence on the rest of the corporate world? 
Sure. So in small cap, there's lots of really exciting tech businesses um, that I can find. But the key thing, as you know, Dave was saying, you know, we want to be investing in these businesses with these sustainable competitive advantages. So when I'm uh, looking at new businesses, the question I'm always asking is, you know, does this business have a more sustainable competitive advantage than, than something I already own? And so within tech, you know, it's all about applying that same uh, philosophy and saying, you know, does this business have a sustainable competitive advantage and will it will those returns endure um, for a long period of time so you know we've we found lots of businesses within tech that, that, that do fit that uh, process so um, we own uh, we own quite a few businesses um, within the simulation software space so Dave uh, Dave owns a business called Ansys and I own a business called Altair these businesses um, have developed over a very long period of time complex algorithms that enable you to apply real world forces on on objects on your on your computer so these were sort of born out of i'm sure you've seen those videos of people of all those cars getting smashed into walls with crash test dummies so turns out that's really expensive to do um and so altair were a pioneer um in developing these algorithms that meant you could basically see what what the impact of these forces were um on different parts of a car so instead of having to sm smash 100 cars into all you could do that a million times on a computer on a bit of computer software and ansys does it for lots of other different uh different applications as well so dave and i have worked closely together looking at simulation software uh, again but these are businesses that the algorithms have big moats around them and it's really hard you can't dave and i just couldn't go out it's a good example ourselves. where we try and work together yeah. so I mean, to, to be fair, Scott Scott did all, all the work basically <laughs> on, on the space. Um, I'm not sure what I added there, but, but, but we did work very closely yeah. with Ben Moore, who works on our European team. Uh, it covers Dasso, who's another one of the third, basically the third player in the space. So. So, so he wanted to get to know these names because they 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 might be a competitive threat to, to something that that he looks at. And obviously, we've got a, 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 you know a really good US equity anal uh, US analyst who looks at the space as well. Yeah. So, and, and other fund managers in the group who who have an interest. So, we're able to sort of talk to lots of people around the group and really try and cherry pick the the, the best ideas. So, in the, the case of the large cap fund, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, you know the name that that, that we hold. Is possibly a bit less exciting than, than than the name that Scott Scott holds, but arguably it's a little bit safer as as, as well. And that and that's sort of what you might typically see between small cap and, and large cap. Yeah, and I mean it's interesting. I used to own Ansys in in the portfolio, um, but it got too large. It graduated and became that sort of large cap of tomorrow. Um, and now De and now Dave owns it. So, you know, within within tech, you know, we're finding lots of businesses that have like high switching costs. So, you know, for an example, with Altair and Ansys, this is what simulation engineers use every single day to complete their jobs. We're also finding businesses in tech that have. Uh, network effects as well. So you know, you think of Facebook in the large cap space. You know, that's a business where the more people that use use that service, the more valuable it becomes. Okay, thank you both. Um, we'll be coming back to you later to learn a little more about the faces behind the funds and to get you to answer a rapid fire film and music questions. I hope you're all ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> First, however, uh, it's time to take a step into the financial past to see what was happening in October throughout history. On the 1st of October 1908, the Ford Model T was launched at a cost of $825, generally considered as the first affordable car. The auto sector is now a massive economic component and is expected to break through sales of 100 million vehicles by 2020, according to Consultancy.uk. On the 3rd of October 2008, the Emergency Economic Stabilisation Act was signed by President George W. Bush. Uh, this bailout bill was a response to the global financial crisis and allowed for the purchase of distressed assets from financial institutions. The fallout from the crisis still being felt today. On the 6th of October 2010, photo sharing app Instagram was founded. Within two months, it had a million registered users. Within a year, 10 million. And as of May this year, it had a billion. It was bought by Facebook in April 2012 for around a billion dollars. So Dave, you were a fund manager back in 2008 during the financial crisis. What was it like managing money through that period? 
Uh, I'd only just taken over the the, the, the management of a, of a European fund actually at the time, so it was a bit of a baptism of of, of fire, to be honest. And um, yeah, it was certainly exhilarating. Um, and I, I think one of the main things that um, you know, in retrospect, our sort of style of finding companies with a competitive advantage, it worked really well, um, and we were able to to you know, over the next 12 months, buy into some businesses where the share price um, had collapsed in many cases because people were were, were very worried about the, the prospects for the global economy. Um, and that meant that you could get very attractive prices for some great long-term growth businesses. Um, so in, 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 in retrospect, you know, we, we in a funny sort of way, did, did, did relatively well out of the, the crisis, although, uh, you know, obviously, I, I wish it hadn't happened, and, and the, 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 um, uh, you know, the circumstances under which I took over the fund had been a bit different. But um, I, I think it was it, sort of exhilarating times, and um, but in retrospect, it was it was a, a, a very good starting point to, to to really take advantage when when asset prices were very very low. Yeah. I guess that's when a longer term philosophy pays off you know it allows you to see beyond the next Ho hopefully and i think as well i think the good thing is that you can sort of take your investors with you um in the sense that you know they know what type of businesses that you're looking for and that therefore this might rather than take panicking and taking their money away from you that actually this might be the time to to, to sort of double down uh, i guess and that's a, a great strength that we have that sort of relationship i think with many of our customers yeah and you think about the i mean going back to what they said before you think about the types of businesses that we invest in you know they tend to be the global leaders in, in what they do um so even during you know fallow periods and recessionary times you know this often still tends to be demand for what they do and the business models we look for are those that we believe can endure for for very long periods of time we do look a lot at businesses that have very conservative balance sheets yeah. so a lot of them are net debt and that means that they can keep going if the banks aren't lending them money etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and also we like businesses that have a lot of recurring income so consumer staples maybe arguably they're not they're not recurring in the sense that they're not you know absolutely guaranteed but the the even during a recession people still keep buying beer um, it, it doesn't then toothpaste it doesn't go up very much but it doesn't go down very much either uh, and we like a lot of these businesses or or businesses that have a high service component for example yeah. that will, will that will keep going on even if new sales are, are depressed you know and with these high margin profiles that dave mentioned earlier and low and low capital intensity they tend to generate a lot of free cash flow so even during you know uh, recessionary times they can continue to generate high degrees of free cash flow to survive. Right then Jim, let's crack on with part two of our fund manager grilling as we find out a bit more about the faces behind the funds. Dave, let's look back to the start of your career. Did you always want to become a fund manager? Uh, no, I wanted to be a footballer, but was <laughs> <laughs> a very honest well, answer. That was, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That moment, that moment's gone. Uh, so um, I, I worked out in Hong Kong for a few years um, uh, in a variety of sort of different businesses. So I sold sugar. I worked for an airline. Uh, and subsequently, I've never invested in an airline or, or in a sugar company. <laughs> so I think it taught me something. Uh, and then I came back and went to university again and got a master's degree. Uh, and yeah, what I liked about fund management um, was that you, yeah, if you've, it, it, yeah, if you're interested in the world around you, I think it's a really interesting space. What about you, Scott? Did you how did um, you find your way into it? So, I mean, I studied chemistry at university, um, but did go straight into the industry. But I really enjoyed. So, my first experience of investing was uh, <laughs> my my dad asked me. I think when I was like 12 if I wanted to buy shares in a company, and basically gave me um, a list of companies on the FTSE All Share, which. 
Um, I remember buying shares in Cadbury because I like chocolate and I was 11. Um, <laughs> and so um, and I remember like checking the share price of like Cadbury's like every or once in a while. And then I remember it, get, it got bought by Kraft, right? Um, and so that was like my first experience of like investing when I was younger. And I sort of was like hooked after that. So it was something that I always wanted to do. Um, something I was always interested in, you know, at school I did. I really enjoyed doing chemistry as well. And it was a great degree to do because it was, you, you builds up that sort of analytical mindset. Um, so when I left uh, Oxford in 2012, I went straight into the industry at an ESG focused asset manager. I, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. It's all useful skills to bring into your job, isn't it? Yeah, yeah well, it's funny, chemistry. So um, like I said, it's a lot, you know, I don't think there's a degree necessarily that prepares you um, perfectly for doing asset management, right? And actually having a diverse range of um, backgrounds is great because you don't get caught up all thinking the, the same thing. You all approach problems from different angles. So you think, you know, Ben Ben Moore studied music. You, you get people from different backgrounds with different ways of approaching problems. It's actually like a much better way of doing it from when you're investing, you know, when there's, when you're looking at a problem, you want people to approach that problem from different ways so you can find gaps in your your knowledge and how you how you thought about it. So it's actually, you know, doing chemistry was great. It was, uh, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but. Although it's not like I'm doing titrations at my desk day to day, but um, you know the skills are the skills are portable to what we do. Yeah, so I mean we've established there's not a typical way in, but uh, is there a typical day at work? Oh, I thought you were going to say is there a typical <laughs> way out? out? <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cardboard box through the front door. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, a typical. I mean, a, a good day is when we get the chance to meet companies so a typical day for Scott seems to be out of the office um, but because if you're doing small cap and particularly globally you have to spend a lot of time on on, on the road um, I guess if you're doing large cap more companies come to you and there are conferences so that's that's a that's a great day is when you get to see some 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 companies or, or, or pick the brains of some some analysts up to study a topic a bit more in depth. Um, but you, know, you might be involved in marketing, you yeah. might be, there's a lot of admin associated with the role as well. So um, there isn't really a, a, a typical day. I mean, you know, if I'm, you know, from the we do a lot of reading, uh, learning about the companies uh, that, you know, try and understand what they do. So I'll speak with, you know, consultants and, you know, buy where I can speak to people who are buying and selling that product. And like Dave said, I spend a lot of time trying to go meet these businesses. They don't travel in the small cap space quite as much. So I often have to go to those companies and meet them and try and work out what they do. And so, you know, I'm often in uh, the United States, you know, I've done, I've had days helping sell pest control um, and going door to door with someone in a pickup truck and literally I was fishing, uh, I was I was helping him get the dead mice out of the traps in a woman's attic in rural Pittsburgh and helping him sell pest control and then the next day I was at uh, a factory that manufactured paint and then I was at a factory that made uh, breathing apparatus for firefighters and hard hats. Um. So tell me, how often do you think about the end investor when you're working? I mean, it's it's the it's the first and last thing. Um, you know, we you know we've got a uh, duty to you know uh, look after people's um, nest eggs. It's what people have worked towards uh, their whole life, and so you know when you're making an investment decision, you know it's it's important that you you get this right because this is what someone's worked towards day in day out for well, all they've done. So it's, simple answers. I'm an investor in, yeah. in, 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 in You are the, the end investor that, as well. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. so, you know, we've got our own money and our family's money invested in, in the products that we've run, so that, um, you know, that does yeah. align our interests, I, I think, quite a lot. And yeah. I think one thing is it does make you, it, it possibly means in my case that we're not always interested in the fastest growing investments, but we look a lot at the, the downside risks in, yeah. in, involved. and. You know, we'd rather err on the side of caution and invest in pest control, a business that's always going to be around, um, but isn't necessarily going to, um, you know, grow at 20 or 30% unless we get you know, some terrible termite invasion or, you know, <laughs> or something like that. So it'd be great um, for them. <laughs> I, I think it does, um, 
make you very cognizant of the risks as well as the upside. We'll wrap up this segment then with a few rapid fire questions for you both. Um, okay, let's start with you, Dave. What's your favourite book? Uh, it's probably Our Mutual Friend by uh, Dickens. Oh, okay, I've not read that one actually. Shame on me. <laughs> no, ditto, actually. Shamefully. Uh, what about you, Scott? That's probably why I chose it. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, it's prob- probably maybe maybe Moneyball by Michael Lewis. So I'm really into baseball. My dad's American, so I got caught up on a bit on. I had like an Anglo-American uh, upbringing, so I'm quite into baseball and linking that into investments. Really interesting. And then being a big fan of uh, Fever Pitch as well by Nick Hornby as well. Uh, yeah, 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 really good. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, what about favourite films and TV shows? Oh, this is Spinal Tap and The Sopranos for me. Oh, I'm gonna, oh that's, that's annoying. I've one also too. got The Sopranos as well, my TV, TV show. That's mine as well, actually. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but I quite like Seinfeld as well. Just more, more again of that Americana upbringing. Then film, probably Ferris Bueller's Day Off as well. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, your favourite uh, band songs, albums. This is tricky for me. Yeah, this my, is, my, where, where are you going to go? My, my daughter's only eight, so, so now I, I, I'm afraid I don't listen to much new music at all. So uh, it, you know, it's probably Sparky songs or something. <laughs> terrible. Um, but I, I, so I have to go years back and I'd say my, my favourite album is probably Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. So, oh, nice. Um, probably, so I've... Uh, I just never listen to any modern music, really. Um, my, da- my dad's influence on my music taste has been pretty heavy, so I think my, probably my favourite album would be Graceland by Paul Simon, um, which I actually remember going to buy that in. I was in High Ashbury in San Francisco. You know, I should be buying, you know, American Beauty by The Grateful Dead instead of buying Graceland by oh, Paul yeah. Simon. Well, I, remember- I was like, the only person buying any. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, I remember buying that in cassette. So, yeah, there, so there you go. That's yeah, that's... That's how technology uh, can erode your competitive advantage, I guess. Is, you know, no one's buying. No, I mean, that, that one, you know, the first, first album was Discovery by Daft Punk, so big fan of that. And then bands, I mean, Tom Petty, The Who. But Dave and I have a mutual love of Steely Dan. Oh, right. oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, what about sports? Are you football fans? You got a favourite football team? Yeah. Dave, why don't you start and tell us who your favourite football team and I can chime in on, on, on a bit of background. Oh, this, 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 sounds, this sounds like there's, well, a, there's, there's, there's a story. There's a story here. I'm a big football fan and a big cricket fan. Um, so, unfortunately, um, I grew up in South London um, and my mum grew up in Somerset. So, unfortunately, I've ended up supporting Crystal Palace and Somerset cricket club and um, whammy. well it is a double whammy because Somerset have been around since 18 in the 1890s and have never won the, the county championship <laughs> and Crystal Palace been around for over a hundred years never won <laughs> and, and and more to the pity they never will but, so, but Dave uh, I'd like to ask where do you currently have season tickets to which which football team do you have season uh, tickets to I have season tickets to at Arsenal. Arsenal, oh, so, okay. Uh, so this we, is we live about five so, minutes walk from the stadium. So, so you I, so and uh, and and my wife is an Arsenal fan and, and my fan. we're trying to encourage my daughter to enjoy football. So you are, <laughs> so you start taking but, it to Crystal Palace. <laughs> we never started. <laughs> so I'm a I am a probably as you can tell a big Arsenal fan, season ticket holder, I'll travel home and away. Can, always with a can of WD forty. Always yeah. with a can of WD forty. You never know when there's a when there's a hinge that needs uh, some water dispersing. <laughs> never, down. you never, you never know. I've got to take the travel can though, and it's got to fit in that little plastic bag. So no, I'm a big Arsenal fan. Um, so I've enjoyed considerably more success than Dave. Uh, when it comes to sports, because Although my dad will it's, it's, no, no, it's, it's not no. about winning, Scott. It's about the journey. It's about yeah. the journey. Where's where's the where's the journey? Where's the where's the ends on the journey? What's the what's the well, playoff finals? They're, playoff they're, they're, playoff they're, finals. They're, they're, they're brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then something, I'm, something that Arsenal will never know about. No, <laughs> thankfully. And then I'm also a big fan of the uh, New York Yankees. Uh, my dad's from the Bronx. So I spend a lot of time at home watching baseball, um, and then also again the New York Giants as well. Um, yeah, you know I've got a lot of US family, so um, we we go to whenever I'm over, I try and go to a couple of games at MetLife. Um, so yeah, very good. And we're Desert Island food for you both. Oh, I see. Well, well mine's quite I, I, niche because I, it's oh. it's pizza from uh, Johnny's Pizza in Mount Vernon, New York. 
It's oh, very, it's, very uh, specific. So, mm -hmm. so for 75 years, it's like, it's, it's cash only, no slices. It's a proper New York institution. Right. And, yeah. well, a, bit, a bit similar to that. So I'm a big lover of Spain um, and um, got good friends in Madrid. And there's quite a famous sort of sandwich shop in Madrid that basically the speciality is yeah a squid sandwich. So that's oh, I'd, 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 I'd have a I'd have a, me, actually, I'd, yeah. I'd have a squid sandwich. A squid sandwich. <laughs> Although it's, I hope it's not a hot island for both. It's nothing like it's a, yeah, 90 degrees and we've got pizza and squid sandwich. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, you, it's got to be in, in winter. Yeah, it's got yeah, to be. Yeah, it's good. Very good. Um, what about your hero? Have you got a hero? Uh, Dennis Bergkamp for me. Dennis yeah, Bergkamp growing up all about yeah. It's all about Dennis Bergkamp. Genius. Yeah. Well, I suppose. Is your, is your, is your, is your Crystal Lou, Palace? No, Lou Reed used to be my hero. Lou Reed, yeah. really? Yeah. I thought you'd go for like, you know, well, Kasaragi or something like that. Right, now before we finish, we're going to quickly look at three things you can ask your IFA this month. With a recent Good Money Week stat showing that around a third of women have no investments or funds, why not find a suitable IFA to take your first steps towards building a nest egg? Visit the FCA website for help on finding an IFA near you. Post-summer is a good opportunity to reset your finances following any holiday over-expenditure. Think about consolidating any loans and or credit cards you might have into a single debt at a potentially better rate of interest. You could be able to save yourself a good sum each month. Ask your IFA about your options. And talking of making sure your finances are all in place, it's never a bad time to make sure your will is up to date or, like me, write one for the first time. Will Aid is a charitable will writing scheme where solicitors waive their normal will fee for a voluntary donation in the month of November. Talk to your IFA about the things you might want to include in it and then search for a solicitor taking part. Well, that's about it for this episode. Uh, all that's left is to thank our guests, Dave Dudding and Scott Woods for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's been a riot. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to my co-host for this episode, Corinne Walker. Thank you. And we'll be back next time when we'll have another fund manager to take our 60 second challenge and talk us through their specialist field. If you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, let us know at podcast at ColumbiaThreadneedle.com. But until next time, thanks again for listening and goodbye. Important information. Your capital is at risk. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The analysis included in this podcast has been produced by Columbia Threadneedle Investments for its own investment management activities. Information obtained from external sources is believed to be reliable, but its accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. None of Columbia Threadneedle Investments, its directors, officers or employees make any representation, warranty guarantee or other assurance that any of these forward-looking statements will prove to be accurate. The mention of any specific shares or bonds should not be taken as a recommendation to deal. This podcast is not investment, legal, tax or accounting advice. Investors should consult with their own professional advisors for any advice. Issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, number 573204. Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N6AG, authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle Group of Companies.